Great. Yeah. Um, first, Rick, thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined uh, both live and who might watch the recording. Uh, for those of us like Melissa and I who've, who, who build, who've been building companies, it's interesting to be at the size and scale where now you're talking about a little bit of what you've built. And there's so much more that we have to do. But we're grateful for the opportunity to share what we've learned. And we'll make this invite now, but we'll also make it throughout. If you have thoughts, um, if you're doing something that we could learn from, uh, we are always in the market to learn. And so thank you, Rick, for starting a group that's all about learning and growing. And thank you to everyone that's listening and and, and an open invite to, to help us get better, too. So um, to, to just kick it off, uh, I'll, I'll maybe talk a little bit about um, what just what Verda is uh, and and uh, and then we can share our backgrounds and whatnot. So um, Verda Health is a digital health company that provides a clinically proven treatment to safely and sustainably reverse type 2 diabetes, obesity, and other chronic metabolic health diseases. We deliver personalized nutrition and continuous monitoring, as well as clinical support through a tech platform. <clears throat> and our model integrates technology and clinician care to deliver incredible outcomes like 10% uh, body weight loss at about a, at, at a year, an average A1C improvement of about 1.2 points. And we do all of this in this incredibly distinctive way, which includes stopping the use of drugs like insulins and GLP-1s. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, I, I've already heard from a couple of people today that I think uh, there was some exciting research discussed on the Today Show today about mental health. Um, and we know our treatment works for a range of metabolic conditions and, and even other conditions. Um, our primary focus, as Amit said right now, is on type 2 prediabetes and obesity reversal, because unfortunately, that is such a massive market and such a huge problem to solve. So that's what we are laser focused on. It's what we've been laser focused on for the past five five to seven years. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, just, you know, again, to... to reiterate what really makes Verta unique um, is that we focus on the root cause of the chronic condition. Um, and then by focusing on that root cause, we deliver a sustainable life change, as Amit said. So we really hear from our members that um, a lot of their cravings go away and they're able to sustain this because they feel so much better. Um, and then just a final point about one thing that I really love about Verta is, again, because of our business model and how we get paid and other things like that, um, incentives truly are aligned and that's not true at all companies. And so truly, at the end of the day, we can always say what's best for our members and our paying customers um, is also best for Verta. So that's, you know, one of the reasons why I think me and I have both been at Verta for over five years. The time people stay at businesses always indicates how good the business is. So that's indeed a good uh, data point. Um, and can you also just tell the audience a little bit what you do at Verta day to day? Sure. Yeah. So I run our clinical ops, which means uh, mostly uh, have the privilege and pleasure of, of leading our health coach team. Uh, we also have a small but mighty uh, support team that helps resolve more administrative issues. And then we also have, um, which we can talk a little bit about our, our more uh, care ops team that supports the growth and the quality of our coaching and also the physical supplies. Um, so I like to say, you know, we'll talk about this more later. My, I view my role at Verta, uh, which is really to help more people be more successful and do it in an efficient way. Um, and I like to think that I bring the people and the process and the technology together and really ensure that we have, you know, the right people in the roles, the right amount of people and that they have the tools and the structure and systems that they need to be able to help uh, transform our members' lives. Yeah, and I, uh, I've i had the, again, the pleasure of working with Melissa for the last five years. I've been at Verda for the last seven and change, seven and a half years. Uh, and uh, and actually used to have Melissa's job, but wasn't that good at it. So found Melissa, and uh, and now that that you know that that's really taken off. Um, I lead. Uh, one thing we'll talk about more today is how Verda is uh, this magical combination of clinical care delivered by clinicians and technology. And so I lead our broader. Um, kind of care delivery approach, which is our technology and operations teams, um, which includes both the product development side as well as the, the clinical care delivery side. Um, and uh, and the, again, I Melissa said it best, and this is where you could already see the, this is one of the things we'll talk about is alignment. Um, I wake up every day thinking about how to get more people uh, sustainably successful using Verda, uh, and it's just the best job for me. I, I love it. <clears throat> 
Thank you for that. And then obviously part of the successes of your care team and also just the care that you deliver is, is your technology stack. So can you like high level explain to the audience what you, you're you using day to day from like an Ops or Care Ops perspective? Absolutely. I, uh, I'll i take this one because... Um... Uh, because again, it's that that combination of of both care delivery and and technology. You know, without getting too deep into the stack and data layers and things like that, at a high level, we basically have two key apps when it comes to care delivery. Um, one is our member facing app. Uh, that is the I always we used to say we're a virtual clinic, and the walls of our clinic are actually digital walls. It's all all the care that we deliver is through an app, and so um, which is you know, again, a, a reframing of, of care delivery for, for many people, um, but just something that we, you know, the way to think about it is that you can't go to a Verda anything if you're a patient, you just go in the app. Uh, and then the second app is our internal EMR. Both of these work in concert together, and we built them both from scratch. So our care model's very unique in that we're constantly getting data from our members that we then use to personalize their experience near real time. And so, for example, on a daily basis, we get biomarker data from our members. They're talking to their coach potentially, um, you know, in an asynchronous manner. They are uh, looking at content. Um, we are in. We're we're able to then dynamically change what they see and and their app experience. We're also dynamically. Uh, changing their the intervention that clinicians might have with them based on the information that we're that we're collecting. So all of this data gives us predictive value and context that we use to influence care flows. And again, the purpose of everything that we do is to drive the outcome of a transformed life, of an improved metabolic health. Uh, and so um, and so that's what we're focusing towards. So instead of the typical standardization, because that's what we discuss a lot, like you need standardized care pathways, you're more of like personalization, right? So you take data points from a patient, like the amount of steps or even my blood pressure of my or my glucose level. And then based on that, you drive the care flows, something like that. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're trying, we are, we're personalizing at scale. And it's interesting that there are pieces of that that we need to standardize, right? And Melissa will talk, we, we're still creating care flows, like when, you know, what intervention might work for what type of patient, et cetera. Uh, because again, we that we can leverage a, a huge data set to know what, what might work and what, what might not. And so we do want to standardize what we believe is going to work. Um, but you're absolutely right that um, we're standardizing so that we can personalize more effectively. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I would just add, you know, I think, again, one thing that makes Verta really unique, we talk a lot about having this concept, having a coach in your pocket, right? So, um, you know, for better or worse, our, our coaches are very accessible. Members can essentially reach out to them any day or time. So that drives, of course, a lot of the care because people can proactively reach out when they're having a challenge, when, you know, they have a question about, uh, you know, maybe what they can eat at a restaurant, you know, this weekend, things like that. And then again, because we are so focused on ensuring our members are successful, then we have that proactive outreach that, that you described, Rick, which is we can see those trends and we can say, hey, you know, and really personalize it, right? Because maybe for someone, you know, they're used to being up here, we can reach out to them and we see that dip here, right? Um, when and, and try to prevent before maybe the weight regains, we can um, intervene. Um, and then, you know, again, Namit and I, um, didn't really touch on it, but we also do have a, a medical team as well at Verda, uh, NPs and providers that are kind of alongside the coaches, either prescribing or hopefully in our case, de-prescribing medications. And that care flow kind of exists alongside with the proactive outreach and um, with, the, with the health coach. Yep. And do you have an idea on like the, uh, how many intervention types there are that you support? Because that's a question from Joel from the audience, because there is standardization, but how much of these care or intervention types are really standardized? It's a good question. I'd say we have, you know, specific workflows that are pretty standardized. Of course, safety is, uh, you know, of utmost most importance at Verda. So there are certain things like if we see someone has a, a low, a hypoglycemic event, or 
in our case, maybe high ketones, there, there are very specific standardized workflows that um, are both supported by the app and the technology and the health coach. So for example, even a symptom, a, a member today can go in and log that symptom, get some guidance from the app, and then they can discuss it with their coach as needed. I'd say in terms of adhering to the Verta treatment, um, you know, I think it depends how we start to define interventions. And as Amit said, you know, we we uh, are still working on this. I'd say there's probably, you know, different flavors of a similar intervention, right? A lot of what, well, for example, we like to know maybe what someone's eating because that can help us figure out how to help them. And there's numbers of ways to ask that, right? We can ask them to food log. We can ask, and in many ways, sometimes we use fat secrets. Sometimes they send us photos in the chat. We can say, what do you normally eat for dinner? What'd you eat for dinner last night? What are you planning on eating for dinner, right? So to me, that's kind of all under the intervention of trying to understand what someone's eating today, what are their preferences? And there's probably a hundred different ways to, to ask the question. Um, and I think, again, one thing that's really unique about Verda, we want our coaches to be human. We want them to establish that rapport with members. And so we don't say, you know, send this exact message. We want it to sound like they're, they're a human and like their coach and build that rapport. Yeah, that makes sense. And then on the on the coaching side, so Melissa, you mentioned that you you manage that. So can you tell the audience a little bit more on like the org structure from a care operations perspective? Because to your point, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but you offer care 24-7. So that means <laughs> that it's kind of hard to to manage on on, on many levels. Yes, that's right. Um luckily we're not, you know, we're not uh we we are 24 seven in that they can reach out at any time. We we don't staff to 24 seven, which is helpful. Um, so we're very clear up front, you know, that we're not an emergency clinic and, but we do try to get back to very people very quickly. Typically it's within a few hours, um, you know, if, if not sooner. Um, and so as Amit said, you know, just again to say, we have a very collaborative approach at Verda. Um, so while I managed, you know, the, the, I feel like, you know, my, um, product in a sense is, is the people, right? And our, our amazing health coach team. And then I partner with our analytics team, our ML team, our, our product and engineering teams, design teams, and we all work together to really deliver that great experience. Um, for our, you know, kind of care ops team specifically, so our coaching team, um, I think I can share, we now have over, well over 150 coaches and managers, which is really exciting. So um, when I joined, I think we were about 15. So we've 10x um, in the time that I've been at Verda, which is super exciting. And one of the things I think that's really distinct about how we are set up, is, and this has been from the core since, since Amit uh, started the team, is we operate in what we call health coach pods. Um, and it really has just helped us scale. So it's about 10 to 12 coaches per pod led by a manager. That manager, you know, they're really core and key to our business and ensuring um, that two-way feedback loop. So coaches can share what they're hearing from members, which again, informs the product improvements. And then vice versa, that manager can help share the vision, right? I know we're going to get into this later around change and technology. So that manager is super key to ensuring that their whole um, pod of, of members is seeing success. And we have a lot of systems in place uh, to ensure that they're running well. We have weekly pod meetings. It's something we've had since the beginning, uh, monthly coach meetings, you know, lots of in infrastructure that we use to ensure those teams are set up for success. Um, we do have team-based care. So if a coach is out of office, the, the member will have a covering coach. So again, we try to view um, the team as very collaborative. And it's one of, I think, again, the best things about Verda. I think all of our coaches would say the reason they're at Verda is because of all the other coaches, um, being able to learn from other coaches and everybody is so willing to help. So I see it every day, you know, uh, someone might have an emergency and can't take a call and, you know, five teammates are stepping in to help out. So I think that's something really important um, is that team collaboration that we have. And then I did share um, another really important part now is our, our small but mighty care ops team. And they really help ensure that we have that consistent high quality experience. We've seen that as we've grown, 
there is so much in the the managers are doing in the day to day. And again, it's very collaborative. We work very closely together, and that team really helps us ensure that we have smooth onboarding, training, um, our quality assurance uh, practices, and even how we develop and roll out uh, products, which we're going to talk about. We have to be so so thoughtful about how we roll things out to the team and how we get feedback. So that care ops team has been super valuable in ensuring that our coaching team can run successfully. Rick, if it's okay, I'll make a very quick comment on the 24 <laughs> seven comment. Um, uh, as Melissa said, um, we, we want to be uh, very accessible for our members and our patients. That's, that's key to us. And I'll go back to what we talked about earlier, which is the magic of having technology and and, and operations together. Because uh, you know, because our clinics never closed, you apparently don't can't close a digital <laughs> clinic. Uh, uh, it, as as members access the uh, the app and have questions in off hours, we built a lot of technology systems to be able to respond to those um, over the years. Um, when I started at Verda and Melissa mentioned this, you know, we had 10 to 15 coaches and they were on 24 seven, like their phone would yeah. go off in the middle of the night if a patient said something. And so a lot of what we built over the years was so that we could scale. It was, it was relatively unscalable to be, to have, to staff people, especially the type of empathetic people that we wanted 24 seven. And so we, we built systems around that. Yep. That makes uh, total sense. Um, and then maybe, so Verta Health obviously demonstrated like remarkable results in, in reversing type two diabetic and then also in, in many other diseases. And we already touched upon this briefly, but how are you currently designing your care flows or processes today? Like what's the process that you follow there? Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, we, we did touch on this a little bit, but as we said, we're very data driven and it's very personalized to, to the member. Uh, so we, again, we talk a lot about uh, finding the right members at the right time and then hopefully the right intervention. Uh, you know, that piece again is always a work in progress as we learn and get new data to inform that. Um, but that is really what drives our care flows. And then as we've discussed, we partner uh, very, very heavily with our product team um, to design those care flows. I think, again, one of my favorite things and babies, it may not be the most uh, popular, you know, with our coaches, we call them our, our PSR alerts, our patient success rate alerts. Um, the reason why I love them is they are at the core machine learning driven, and they've been that way, honestly, for five years. And because of that, we've been able to adapt them quite quickly. So we really can feed in that new data. And uh, we have like a dropout model that we're able to leverage so that we are hopefully uh, reaching out to those members before it's too late, right? We want to reach them while they're still engaged, right? While we can still help them be successful. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, we have all of that data from all so many members, you know, millions of data points that we now use to feed into that model to really know when our members need, need that outreach. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that, of course, uh, feeds into the care flows and the, the care models is our our clinical content and the clinicians, um, which help empower our patients. And, uh, you know, that's what really enables our, our members to make those sustainable lifestyle changes. Yeah. And then to give a practical or make it a bit more practical. So let's say that I'm um, a type two diabetic patient, and then your system indeed gives you me an alert that I will need uh, help, let's say within 24 seven or tw uh, 24 hours. What then happens is it so it's a sort of SOP designed, which then creates an alert into your system, and then the coach just picks up and they have a working list. Or how do I need to see that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the things you know we really strongly believe is that the system should help identify the members that need outreach. Right, the coach should not have to to uh, go dig into that. So as I kind of shared, it is a combination of. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work coaches are doing is reaching out to members who are reaching out and asking questions. And then absolutely, they have a, a queue, we call it um, in our homegrown EMR, we call it Spark. Uh, so our coaches are in Spark every day. And exactly that, you know, they might get an alert that says this member has a, a hypoglycemia, a glycemic event, right? And again, maybe the apps already asked some questions, but we still want the coaches to follow up, make sure they're doing okay. You know, did they address the low? How 
are they feeling? So they might get some alerts around that. And then they might get alerts, um, again, that are more that machine learning driven to know when we need to proactively reach out. And some of those are celebrations too, I should add. You know, we believe that a lot of, and I still need to read the article you sent me, Rick. I'm very excited to dive in about care, care experience because that's huge at Verda. Um, we know that while at Verda, I would say our coaches get a lot of fulfillment because they're seeing their members, you know, get off uh, drugs and insulin and improve their lifestyle. It, it's still a hard job, right? It's still a demanding job. And so the more we can share that fulfillment to the coaches and those celebrations. So sometimes it's a celebration. Um, sometimes it's a check-in. We just want to ensure they're on the right path. And then sometimes it is, oh, we see, um, you know, that maybe their, their glucose is rising and we want to make sure that we're on top of that. And then we do have uh, a knowledge base as well that coaches can use. So when that happens, there's guidance around what they, what to do, when to reach out to the provider, how to reach out to the provider. So it's very all embedded in their workflow. That again, was something we really have wanted to do since the beginning is making it um, as easy for our, our clinicians as possible. Yeah, and I, I do think that this is a nice topic to touch upon as well, because what's clear from this conversation is that Verta never has the in, ambition to replace the clinician or the coach whatsoever. It's more to augment them and, and to give them a really great care experience so they can focus on, on the things that matter versus doing all the manual stuff that they are used to do. So. Yeah, yes. that's right. And I, yeah, I mean, it, we talk about that all the time. You said it really well. And I think another great example I'll use, because I know it's helpful to have real life stories. So um, I mentioned symptoms, you know, as people may know, sometimes when you're making lifestyle changes, you might have headaches, as we discussed at the beginning, or muscle cramps. Coaches used to get alerted to these symptoms. So if, if a member just put headache in, they would get alerted every time. <laughs> it was probably the bane of their existence because half the time the member was like, well, this either isn't related to Verda or I know what to do, right? I'm going to drink water or whatever because we've instructed them to that. So it was silly that we were asking the, the coaches to reach out every time. And now what we've built, as I kind of hinted on earlier, is they can add that symptom there, the app can can get some additional details. We provide some guidance, and then they can reach out to the coach if they want more. Um, or for certain symptoms, we might say we're going to reach out no matter what. So it's really about you know I like to say work smarter, not harder. We want the app and the technology to answer those questions that don't need to be answered by a human, so that our humans can spend more time with the people that we know are going to need more intense coaching um, and might need a phone call or might need you know more of that troubleshooting coaching. And that's really, I think, the key to Verda's success. Yeah, and I'll um, I'll add a, a couple of philosophical points that we had very early on at Verda, and uh, to your point, Rick. We've always believed in the value of coaching, and again, this uh, this coming together of technology and, and clinical care. And so, we believe there are things that only humans can provide other humans, um, and those are empathy, creativity, complex clinical problem solving, and emotional accountability. And so, that that's what we want our clinical staff to be able to deliver most often. If you think about the normal healthcare system, generally. They're delivering some subset of that, but in order to get paid, they also have to deliver a bunch of other stuff. Um, uh, but because we're outcomes focused, we can say, hey, we really just want our humans, our clinicians to focus on those core skill sets and finding ways to deliver those. And then the way that works with care flows, as Melissa was saying, is you could think of two types of care flows, rather reactive, where a member is asked something. Um, and so if that, if responding to that requires empathy, creativity, clinical problem solving or emotional accountability, you know, it'll get routed to a coach. If it's just like knowledge, then hopefully we can route it to content, right? Like this is where, this is where having the technology do that work um, is more valuable than having a, a coach do that. Um, and then for proactive workflows, this is like, you know, our data is telling us that Rick might need outreach. Um, we want to, we want to, with a high degree of fidelity, know who, um, Rick, we want we, we want to give the coach some direction or the clinician some direction on why. Well, because he is, you know, we've seen him start to fall off track in the lifestyle change because of these factors. And then we want to be suggestive on on what, which is like here's some interventions that might work, but you know Rick best, and you can leverage those 
tools of empathy and complex clinical sol problem solving in order to intervene. And so that's what we that that's kind of a how how we would our philosophical approach to how we would deliver that care. Yeah, and I also assume that this framework of like these four things also helps with deciding what to automate and what not to automate because otherwise it's a conversation that comes back again and again can we automate this and now you you just give the four things and yeah i like it that's that's smart yeah well uh, now you pick our our whole plan rick I'm <laughs> right. the discussion with product the discussion between product development and and coaching is is pretty clear right like is this and does this intervention is in and you sometimes it just requires you getting out of your role and being like as a member as a human do I prefer if my coach says this or if the, if the app says this? And if the answer is even like partially, I prefer my coach to say it, that's, you know, we should build around that. Yep. I love that. And I will definitely steal that. So uh, also like <laughs> reflecting on, on this journey, can you share like a very practical example of a strategy or practice in care flow design? Because for you, it's very cross-functional that didn't go as planned and, and how you adapted based on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I can think of so many, right? <laughs> so uh, just, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to share more, always learning. Uh, one our overarching theme, uh, you know, is, is experimentation and pilots. And I will say I still haven't figured it out, right? <laughs> Tried everything from asking certain coaches, picking a pod, having them volunteers. So I'm still working on like the right, even, you know, pilot approach. Um, but uh, yeah, one example is we've been working on our version of, of a co-pilot system, which essentially means um, providing suggested responses to the health coach. Um, again, as Amit shared, we have, I think, millions, I'm millions of messages, right, and examples where we've potentially answered, you know, or addressed this, this particular challenge historically. So we said, let's use our, um, you know, proprietary information, right, to help make the, the coach's jobs easier. We set up, uh, again, this in a very tight um, loop with the product team and the engineering team to iterate and get, get feedback quickly and with the subset of coaches. And I think, you know, a couple learnings from this is, one, we kind of maybe assumed that um, our, our data set was the right one, right? And that, and you know, that it has to be good quality, right? If you're going to then suggest that to coaches. And it's not that that it was necessarily wrong. It's just that as we have new members, we maybe need to shift the way we do coaching. So that was definitely something um, that we had to kind of rethink and revisit. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, and maybe some of them are on the call for that group. At the beginning, it's it's not always a great model, right? It has to learn. Um, and so I think it can always be frustrating, to see how is this going to help me, right? How is this going to help me in my role? And then, of course, there in this case, it was a little bit of a balance of like, is this trying to replace me? Um, I can do it better. And so, again, trying to think about and and where we adapted was uh, communicating that to the, the team and say, we know this maybe isn't the best. Use this almost as a draft, right? And it's kind of how ChatGPT is today and other tools. Sometimes it can be really helpful to just have a starter. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, right? Um, it might mention something that's a little funky, but does it help get those wheels turning? Um, and I think especially as we scale and bring on new coaches, that can be really, really valuable. Um and of course, the other learning is that now the technology is developing so quickly that, you know, maybe we've spent a lot of time investing in something that uh, now, you know, will be super surpassed in other models. But I still think that, you know, this is a great data set that we can leverage because it's uh, unique to, to Verda's challenges and problems. That's uh, a, a war story that you will love at in a few years, probably. It's, it really works <laughs> yeah, pretty and I, well. Well, and I think just too in setting up the pilot team, I think one learning there was um, we, you know, we did at the beginning really think let's have our, our um, you know, high performing coaches involved. Let's reach out to them, get them on board. And I, I think just a big learning there is sometimes it's not about maybe even the most high performing coaching, but it's about getting people that are excited about the tool. And that's probably one of the biggest learnings I've had. Um, and something that I'm going to try to do going forward is sometimes I think, oh, yeah, this person will be great at it. And they have no interest in it. <laughs> and of course, at some point, 
They're going to probably have to work with it, right, if we do it right. But get the people that are interested in it involved, and I think you're going to get better results. Of course, you know, there's the concept of, um, you know, kind of have your naysayers involved, too, because, you know, if you hear more of those objections throughout the process, then it'll be easier to roll out. So, like I say, it's always a combination. And I think, again, another learning and thing that we try to really instill at Verda is having that mix of experiences involved um, in the development, right? So, of course, our tenured coaches have tons of of valuable knowledge and historical knowledge and experience, but it can be just as valuable sometimes to have a newer coach involved who maybe doesn't have as much, um, you know, uh, context, right? Um, and I think, and I will just mention, because this is unique to Verda, that's true of our care team too. I That's one of the things that I'm really passionate about is we don't require a certain credential or background. We have a very multi multidisciplinary team. And so as I shared before, that's one of the reasons they love working and collaborating with each other because maybe they have a really strong skill set, you know, in nutrition and someone else comes from a social work background um, and they can work with each other and learn from each other. Yeah. And that's a nice segue to how to marry the clinical folks with the technical folks, because when you look at them, they, they talk to different languages <laughs> and it's pretty hard to, Especially I'm a clinician, so I can say that it's very, pretty hard to manage clinicians. Sometimes they are like a real pain in the ass. But engineers <laughs> are the same. It's also like quite painful to, to manage engineers. So do you have certain working principles between uh, clinical ops and product teams and, and even tech teams in general at, at Verta that help you deploy solutions quicker than, for example, anyone else in the space? Yeah, it's a really good question. And again, this is an area that I will reinforce the still learning. We have a system that works decently well. Uh, it's by no means perfect. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're consistently learning on this. Um, but a couple of years ago, we moved our teams to be highly cross-functional. Um, we took a page out of the called the Spotify playbook or the Amazon playbook, or you don't pick any of those. Uh, but we realized that all the work gets done in teams of somewhere between five to 15, where people can be ultra focused on a, a subset of things. And those things are generally <clears throat> um, a specific user base. And so again, I've already shared that we have at least two apps. Note that there are a couple more that we didn't talk about. <laughs> um, but you know, all of our teams are focused on a specific user. Um, and for the purpose of today, we'll just talk about the member. So the patient app, um, they um, they have specific stakeholders and they have shared metrics and these teams are highly cross-functional. And so um, there's a product leader, an eng leader, a design leader, a um, INA, uh, insights and analytics and machine learning leader, and then they're clinical leaders. And they are they all have to work together in order to um, in order to move things uh, move things forward. And so everyone, especially on this member experience uh, team, or this patient app team <clears throat> is focused on achieving outcomes. At the end of the day, uh, the one thing that we all have at Verda that is that honestly makes alignment very, very easy is that we're focused on achieving uh, specific member outcomes, which are which is the clinical improvement of their health, as measured by the things I mentioned earlier: weight loss, uh, A1C reduction, or blood sugar improvement, uh, and medication reduction. And so given that we have uh, that clear North Star, um, that is a great rallying cry. To support that North Star, we um, we have a team structure. So as I shared, all teams are cross-functional. Clinicians are a part of that team, um, and they're co-leaders on the relevant product development squads. Um, we have a management infrastructure to support that. So the KPIs that um, the pods are responsible for align directly with the KPIs that the product development leaders are responsible for. And so it's not like, hey, we're going to build this thing that, you know, that is out, you know, that, that, that will help, I don't know, that will help, uh, you know, a different set of metrics and somehow they can be successful, but we won't deliver on the thing that we want to, which is improved outcomes. Everybody you know, has a shared set of those metrics um, and that are, and again, the leading indicators are broken down to the squad level so that that team of five to 15 knows what they're responsible for and, and can be driving that. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, it comes, it comes down to culture as many of the folks on the call and you yourself, Rick, are well aware of. We try to be um, very clear, and Melissa said this at the beginning of a, one of the things that 
we've appreciated about Verta since day one is if you do what's best for the member or the member or the, or, or the broader set of patients, um, you're doing what's right for Verta. And so we focus on delivering for that, for, the, for that group. And I think that culture really permeates, you know, that you, that's true. If you're an engineer, that's true. If you're on the machine learning team, and that's true if you're a health coach. Um, and so that, um, that, that makes decision-making slightly easier um, but yeah, that, that's kind of how we try to build synergy into the system. I, I, I tend to think of it in the three buckets of what's our operating system, like how our team structured and, and who's on what team and, and, and all that. What's our management infrastructure? What do we hold people accountable to? Um, and, and, and how do we, you know, how do we hold them accountable to those things? Uh, and then, and then what's our culture? Like, what is the, the thing that everyone rallies behind and, and how do you talk about that? And so that's, you know, that's how we achieve that. So in so instead of the typical CEO and then uh, operations product clinical, you have like all these spots where people then operate like more, um, not per se siloed, but more focused on one specific goal, not one function. Okay, that's uh that's obviously what CareOps is all about because we want to see more collaboration between these roles and the way that you typically set up an, a, a company structure is, is not built for that. So that, that's definitely very interesting. We tried something similar uh, at AWOL as well, but it, it, it sounds very easy to do or implement, but it's quite painful, I assume. What's like one of the lessons there when you shifted or pivoted to that model? Yeah, I will say it's super hard. Uh, I, you know, and again, we tried to do this uh, about two years ago, and I would say two, two and a half years ago almost. And I would say that we really, um, again, are still learning and still iterating on it. Some of the early lessons we had is that um, guilds are important. Uh, and so, and when I say guild, it, it you know, I, I think of a guild as the engineering guild, like there, what it takes to be a good engineer, there's a certain set of skills, just like what it takes to be a good coach. There's a certain set of skills. And um, and sometimes when you organize cross-functionally uh, and you make that the, the organizing uh, structure, you can lose the importance of the guild. You can lose what it means to be a good designer and making sure that your top design talent is learning from other top design talent, et cetera. And so, um, and I'll, I'll say this personally, because I, I'm the one that tried to make this org structure and messed it up, um, where I, I tried to, I, I, I overly de-emphasized the importance of guilds. And so what we learned is that it's super important that great engineers report to great engineers, you know, I, and so like the, the structure of, um, of, of how, uh, en the engineering reporting structure, the design reporting structure, the coach reporting structure um, has you reporting to those people in a line in, in in your guild because that is like where you can improve your skill set. Um, then you're taking the best of your guild and applying it to this set of problems, and then we've aligned the metrics around the outcomes um, so that everybody is coming together to push that forward. And so it is a little bit of a matrix and we do spend a lot of time um, managing both the kind of the horizontal and the vertical, um, which is making sure that guilds are able to bring the best of their skill set to each individual and that individuals then are taking what they need um, and delivering it to the cross-functional team that they're on. And to use a really bad sports analogy because you know, I don't know a ton about sports, but it's like what I what I often think about is I went to Michigan and Michigan won the national championship this year. So go blue. Um, but they have a quarterbacks coach and an offensive line coach. And a, but no at no time on the field do they have like 10 quarterbacks on the field. Right. Like the quarterbacks coach is there to make sure that the quarterbacks are really good quarterbacks. So whichever one is on the field is is doing their part to make the team successful. And that's how that's kind of how we think about guilds and cross-functional teams. Like at the end of the day, everything we do is as a cross-functional team for to, to make Verta successful, to make our members successful. Um, but you have to bring the best of your skill set to that team in order for that to happen. Yeah, okay, last question on this because it's definitely an, a rabbit hole. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Samisa. Well, I was just gonna add, Rick, but maybe on a, on a more like, you know, <laughs> tactical level or not even tactical. I also think it works because of, this might sound a little cheesy, but like respect. I think at least for me at Verda and why I've been at Verda is because all of the leaders hold a lot of respect for each other and in their area. And I think we all know that we can't do our job without each other. And so if you go in with that mentality of like, like 
the product team can't deliver what they want to achieve because most of the things they're building requires the coaches to be effective at it, right? And to use the product. And like, I can't, you know, hire fewer coaches, right? Um, or increase panel sizes unless the product team builds things that create more capacity. And so I think, again, it, it starts with what Amit said of those shared KPIs and shared accountability. And because of that, we know we, we, we need each other and we respect each other. And I think it's embedded, you know, from the very beginning because of, you know, leaders like Amit, but also through even hiring. Like I sit on the the hiring panels of the PMs and, you know, they sit on some of my panels um, and we have program group meetings and we have one-on-ones and, you know, we have, again, even then cross-functional teams when we launch features and we run pilots. And so I think it's, again, it's just so much of the way that, that we set things up at Verda and it's in, it's like in our, our fabric. Yep. And then last question uh, on this, because I do think that this is like truly care ops, the collaborative efforts between cross-functional teams. What does that mean for the roadmap? Does each pot has its own roadmap and how is it then aligned with the broader roadmap or how do we need to see that? Yeah, well, I think, I was. I mean, one thing that is important because people might be like, well, isn't this your whole company? I mean, there is a lot of other work that needs to happen that we haven't mentioned. So there, we have paying customers. Again, that is the other thing to me that makes Verda unique and why I love Verda is we are truly helping members that need it most because, you know, the majority of our members pay nothing out of pocket. So they're getting this benefit through their employer or the health plan. And that's, again, what makes Verda really unique. It's also what makes it hard because, uh, we have to engage those people and we have to enroll them. Um, so there's a lot of work in teams uh, focused on that side of the business, just around growth and being able to get paid by our customers because that's really important, right? We can't treat <laughs> and build all these cool features and tools um, and hire the coaches if we're not getting paid. Um, and then Verda, because we're a medical treatment, does have an enrollment process. So there's a lot, there's been a lot of focus on growth. Um, I'll say maybe that's been one of the challenging things is that has been our bottleneck to date. So that's where a lot of the resources have gone. Um, but as we scale and grow more than, you know, so I think that maybe Amit, you can talk yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'll uh, rip to answer your, uh, your your question on uh, on this. I think that um, I, I I think that one of the things that you, we we are kind of constantly done is shifted those squads and and groups um, so that we are focusing on the right set of users and focusing on the right uh, metrics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there is some shifting that's involved. Uh, the other thing is a shout out to a really strong um, and, and, and effective product development team. If our tech stack was a monolith as it was, you know, when we first started, um, it, it's really hard because you make a change in one spot and it impacts all these other things. Over the years, we've painstakingly, um, you know, I really hate this analogy because I'm a private pilot, but like rebuilt the plane while we're while, while we're flying it. You never, by the way, want to be in a plane that's being rebuilt while <laughs> while you're flying it. Um, but anyway, we've we've had to do that in in a variety of ways, um, including as Melissa just indicated, like you know, rebuilding our 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 patient onboarding, our member onboarding process through all of last year, but then being able to carve it out so that we can make changes there without impacting other things. And so um, that is a key piece of it. And your technology and product development strategy uh, and the roadmaps, uh, you know, the strategy is the first thing that you need before you do the roadmaps, um, then um, then need to be need to need to reinforce that. And so we do then now we are able to create multiple roadmaps across the product development team because Again, every team is focused on a specific user with a specific specific set of metrics, and for the most part, has their has their piece of the tech stack that they can be impacting without impacting others. Now, that is that perfect and completely true? Of course not. Um, but that's um, completely true everywhere. No, but that is that is the philosophical approach. And over the years, we've made that more and more true as we will continue to to do. Yeah, I love that. I'm very big on the, I call it composable architecture, which you also mentioned instead of the monolith, got like to these all smaller microservices to, mm -hmm. to move faster. And obviously with moving faster, Melissa, there also comes challenges in, in, the, in the sense of like change management. And if you make a change to a specific care flow or SOP, then you need to train your clinicians and, and they need to get used to, to that new way of working. So how do you overcome the typical challenges that are 
yeah, very common when it comes to change management and making care flow changes. Yeah, I think uh, you could probably just change my job description to change management. Uh, <laughs> I think everything is is change management, right? Everything we do. So when you view it, that philosophy and and still we don't always do it well, like even last week, you know, we had exciting news. And actually, I think this is a, a learning is sometimes you even gloss over things than when it's a positive. And so I would stress to people that, you know, spend just as much time on the change management and the rollout for positive changes as for negative or, <laughs> or I should say, you know, more challenging um, changes, uh, because it's super important. Like, again, we, we rolled something out, we're in the midst of it. And I think we did it probably one of the best we've done. Like we had a pilot group, coaches were involved. We took feedback, we iterated, coaches loved it. We saw the, the results in the, in the, in our member uh, data improvements couldn't have been better, but then, you know, maybe when we, we glossed over some of this, th those things as we were rolling it out to the rest of the team. So we just have to be super, super thoughtful. I think acknowledge that any change is hard. Um, I've learned this as Verta has been adopting new technologies, you know, the saying, uh, teach a dog, you know, old dog, new tricks, right? It's just change is hard no matter what. So again, think about that. Um, a couple, I think, again, as, as you've heard me say throughout this, we always, always test things. We always have a pilot group. We would never roll out something, you know, broadly to the team. So that's super helpful. Um, having, like I said, team members involved in the change goes a really long way. Um, you know, the people that are actually going to be using the the new flows um, and then getting feedback. So, for example, um, this latest change that I'm talking about is, is called our Verta in chat assistant. Uh, we had people that went to pod meetings. Our PM went to pod meetings, heard the feedback. We iterated, um, always sharing the why, of course, kind of forgot about that one. But and, and let people know that you will change. I think that's the other thing. Sometimes someone gets something and maybe it's different. If you just let them know, we will keep iterating based on your feedback. That helps a lot. Um, and then I think, you know, the final point, well, two more points. One is um, it is so much better <laughs> if you can get the coaches or the managers to roll out the change or speak to it. It's going to be so much su more successful if a coach stands up and says, I've been using this Verta and chat assistant and it helped me do my work better than if I say it, right? I don't have a panel of members. Um, I'm not in the trenches. So if you can get your advocates to speak on behalf, the other coaches are going to listen and are going to follow. They they respect their teammates um, quite a lot. So that is, is probably the biggest lesson um, is just having them involved in that rollout. Um, and, and then finally, and this is when I would say we haven't, again, crack the nut on is coming back with the learning. So I think this is an area where we haven't always done a great job of, and especially when things don't go well, it's easy to kind of forget about it, gloss over it, move on. But it's really important, I think, to come back to the team because then the next time you roll out a change, they're gonna be like, wait, but what happened to that last one, right? We never heard about that. So it's that continuation and really uh, making sure that you're you're closing the loop and sharing the learnings and, and sharing the, the results. And do you have like a framework on like how much change is too much? Like, do you have uh, an, any recommendations on like rate of change? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, we definitely try not to do too much change. I don't think it's an exact science, but definitely try to be cognizant of that, of like, okay, and what else is going on, right? What, you know, it's a busy time of year. What else are we asking them to do? I think this is where that care ops team has come, you know, in handy quite a lot. We've streamlined, we have very consistent emails now on Friday where we link to the emails that have gone out and the changes that have gone out, you know, very clear ways for people to see the updates, see the changes. Again, we reiterate them in those pod meetings. So it's like many forms of, of communication and updates. So yeah, I don't think I have a great formula, but definitely cognitively try to say we're not changing their work every day, right? Or every week, even that would be too much change. Um, and then I, again, go back to what Amit said, and this is something we can still improve. At the end of the day, what's best for the members, what's best for Verda. I think sometimes still we get too hung up in explaining all the nitty gritty. I'm, you know, working on this right now. Does the coach need to know why the <laughs> assistant triggered? They don't, they might want to know, but they need to know what to do with that information 
when they get it. So I think we could do an even better job of, again, back to what Amit said, teaching that problem solving skills, critical thinking skills. And at the end of the day, all of these tools are to help and our poor treatment has not changed. That's the other thing I remind people of, right? At the end of the day, in the five years I've been at Verda, like our poor treatment has not changed. It's just how do we get members to adhere and all of these tools are there to support it. So if you're ever not sure what to do, again, go back to what's best for the member. And if I do that, I'm doing my job right. Yep, I love yeah, it. What, yeah, go uh, ahead, sorry, Amit. Add, I'll add one thing to the change comment, which is it's something that I think is, we said implicitly um, that I think makes sense to call it explicitly um, is we've also added that to our hiring approach over the years. Um, it turns out if you're going to join a startup or growth company, change the rate of change is something mm -hmm. that is almost, um, you know, by definition going to be faster than what you're used to anywhere else, especially in healthcare, right? The rate of change in healthcare is generally a little bit slower than, you know, than if you're in a large healthcare company, it's probably slower than if you're in a large tech company. Um, but if you're in a large tech company, it's still slower than if you're in a five person startup. And so over the years, I think one of the things that we've learned is that we do want to disproportionately hire people who are comfortable with a higher rate of change. And we call it out directly in the hiring process yeah. for our clinicians, for our, um, you know, for all of our leaders, for sure, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I guess I'll just share that, that some of your question on rate of change relates to the people that are in the seats. And I think we have solved for, not solved for that. We integrate that thinking a little bit further up funnel because we learned that sometimes it's inevitable that, you know, you're, there's gonna, the gulp rate, it was what we call it, the amount of change <laughs> that's happening, um, you know, is just, is just higher. Uh that's definitely helpful. Last question, uh, if I may. So, Melissa, you mentioned multiple times, like the the small but mighty CareOps team. <laughs> Can you, to the audience, explain what they do exactly day to day, and 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 what type of role like is is really good, uh, or what type of profile is is really thriving in, in that team? Yeah, yeah. Well. Um... I will shout out uh, our leader, Naomi Kinkler, who, who runs that team. Uh, she's been awesome, uh, joined about two years ago to help run and scale our coaching team. She has experience working um, at Ginger and then Honor. So lots of experience in both you know, the digital world and the more physical world and running operations. And actually a lot of that team, which is pretty cool, are, are former health coaches and um, the term we use like enrollment advisors. So it's a great growth opportunity for one, I would say for our, our team members who have that deep um, expertise and experience and then can leverage those skills to help the broader team. I'd say it really, for now, again, that team, half of that team is really focused honestly, just on the onboarding and training of our new coaches, we are bringing on uh, pretty large cohorts every month. And, and so that is like a huge part of the job, right, is is instilling that culture and the, the training. I will say we were kind of talking about this at the beginning, especially we used to hire coaches actually in person. I loved it, you know, got to do the training in person, got to hear their questions in person. That is obviously a lot more challenging in the remote world. So that is a full-time job. Um, and Lauren is awesome at it. And then we have Marlia who runs a lot of our ongoing coach training and quality assurance practices. So, you know, one of the big things we've done in the past couple of years is really roll out a more robust quality assurance uh, program to ensure that we do have that high quality of care. And then also following those more critical workflows. You know, we always want to make sure that that we're doing our part in ensuring, you know, member safety and member experience. Um, and then the, the other piece is a little more around that capacity planning, you know, thinking about um, panel sizes and ramp up and number of coaches that need to be hired. Capacity is also challenging at Verda because we are in that more digital asynchronous world. So it's not super clear. Um, so, you know, we spend time on that rolling out new systems. We were talking about that too. So that team manages when we do uh, use new products like TalkDesk, we moved to um, a couple years ago. It's a system where calls can be recorded and um, basically a soft phone, managing Calendly, managing Tiger Text. So managing a lot of the tools, we also use Text Expander. So managing a lot of the tools that help 
the the team more, run more efficiently and effectively. And now also thinking and owning more of that change management again when we are rolling out new processes or products, having that team really own it end to end, getting the coach feedback. It's just really helpful, like I said, to have a little bit of that more neutral team rolling those out uh, and supporting the managers on the coaching team. Uh, because one of the things I also um, have kind of come to believe is that while we don't want to overwhelm our managers, we do try to keep a fairly flat structure because it gets really, really hard. You know, the more layers you have on the coaching team, it also is really hard to to create that change. And so the managers do have a lot on their plate. So the the synergy, you know, and and between the care ops and the coaching team helps essentially run a well-oiled machine. I love that. And I see also see that timing is up and I don't want to take more of your time because you will need to do uh, what's best for the group <laughs> members. So uh, we will part ways. Lastly, on my end, uh, if people are interested in the care of t-shirt, I have a, a few left. Uh, and if you, I, the only thing that I ask in return is to give some feedback on today's session, because I think it was lovely, but uh, we we're all about continuous improvement, which you can also see on the t-shirt. And I also want to improve those sessions and I want to give some feedback to Melissa and Amit as well. But uh, so I will send you the, the link of the form in the chat and it's only for the people that attended this live. So you are definitely privileged. Uh, and for the rest, I want to thank you, Amit and Melissa for your time and for the uh, interesting insights. Hey, we're super grateful that you invited us. Um, as Rick said, we're very interested in feedback. And so please provide any that you have. And we're also really interested in any recommendations. Again, we shared some of the stuff that we're doing all right, but we're learning on all of it. So if you have any recommendations, thoughts, lessons, uh, we're open to them. So thank you. Awesome. We all uh, become smarter day after day. So. That's right. Have a wonderful day. Right. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.